All right. Uh, hello, welcome everybody to the Georgia Tech Graph Theory Seminar. Our speaker today is Sandra Kinga from Brooklyn College, City University of New York, and she will tell us about constructing minimally free connected graphs. Thank you, Anton, for this opportunity to give this talk. So I'm speaking on um, constructing minimally free connected graphs, and it is joint work with uh, Jao Costalonga and Robert Kingin, my husband. This paper appeared um, on uh, January 2nd, I think, of 2021 in Algorithms, and it's available on my web page. Uh, so I'll begin with the introduction, preliminaries, correctness and exhaustiveness of the algorithm, and the algorithm itself and next steps. And the last two D and E are very few slides. The bulk of the slides is really up here in B and C. So I wanted to start with a concept that some of you may know, but maybe not everyone. It's, it's, a, it's a minor, I'm, I'm just looking at the participant list um, and I uh, wasn't sure how much to assume, but I think I'll start with minors. So a graph is a minor, <clears throat> H is a minor of G. If H can be obtained from G by deleting edges, and if any isolated vertices are formed as a result of deleting edges, then you throw them out too and contracting edges. Deleting edges is very simple. It's, uh, so here you have an edge E. Deleting edge just means throw it out, so it's gone. Remove it, but the, the two vertices remain. And the symbol that we use for deleting edges is this, G delete E. Contracting edges is slightly different. You take the two end vertices and you squish it down, contract it down, and um, uh, you know, think of it as uh, uh, take this and you squish it down and then delete the loop. So the edge E disappears again, but in a manner quite different from the deletion. And that is the contraction operation there. Okay, so the next definition I need to get started is that of three connected graphs. Um, again, if you're a graph theorist, this is something you know. A graph is three connected if at least three vertices must be removed to disconnect the graph. And a three connected graph is minimally three connected if removal of any edge destroys three connectivity. So examples of minimally three connected graphs, which is the subject of this talk, is any cubic graph. For a cubic graph is a graph of uh, where every vertex is degree three. Like for example, this prism graph, which is going to feature in subsequent slides. Um, you take out any edge, right? You take out this edge, for example, and then you've lost three connectivity. Um, the wheels are minimally three connected. And so is this graph K3 N minus three is the complete bipartite uh, 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 graph with three vertices on one side and n minus three vertices on the other side. Um, and one quick thing about the wheels, uh, we name the spokes, that's a matroid theory perspective. And I'm a matroid theorist, so my perspective on graph theory is, is very much framed by matroid notation. So the spokes are um, in an n vertex wheel, there's n minus one spoke, so there's that little bit over there. So, all right, so how do I get rid of this over here? Okay, so the first result that I want to mention is this result by Dirac, and um, it appeared in 1963, and it's a very handy result, not only for my work in this um, paper, but also for, as an example of an excluded minor result. So the graphs that have no prism minor, and we'll go with three connected, because the graphs that are not three connected can be built up from the smaller, from two connected and one connected graphs in a particular manner. So we always consider just three connected. So um, graph with no prism minor, if and only if G is isomorphic to, and it gives the precise list. So you have the complete graph on five vertices, K5 delete E, 
the wheels that we just saw, right? This is K3 N minus three, and this is K3 N minus three dash, double dash, and triple dash, all right? So what you have is this beautiful excluded minor result where you exclude one graph and you get precisely what the family is. Now it's not all easy to determine things so precisely and that's why this is a wonderful example of an excluded minor result. So one thing I wanted to mention here is that the wheels and K3N minus three are minimally three connected. Okay, so um, now, uh, in 1969, Harlan, who Harlan and Marder have done such wonderful work, and I'm always referring to their results. And this is a result by Harlan, where um, if G is minimally three connected on N a greater than or equal to eight vertices, so the bound starts a little bit uh, further up, then uh, the maximal number of maximum number of edges in the graph is three N minus nine. And it is precisely 3n minus 9 if and only if the graph is k3n minus 3. So if you blend Harlan's result and Dirac's result, then you get this nice little result here. G is a minimally three connected graph with a prism minor. And the, ma the maximum number of edges is 3n minus 10 because that was the only exception. All right. So, okay. So then I want to mention a small little result by Harari, where he said that if G is a three connected graph with N vertices and M edges, then you have to have at least these many edges. And that's a, you know, a few lines to see it. So what I have here is a visual that sort of frames the situation, frames what we are doing. So the, We'll start with, suppose this is the prism here. So I'm starting with the prism, six vertices and nine edges. And the largest that it would be, the largest, uh, you know, the largest graph is K6. Uh, but the minimally three connected graphs are here. So there's a little bit of um, uh, bookkeeping to claim that there aren't any up here. And then of course, Marder's, uh, Holland's bound kicks in and you have this line here that is maximum number of edges, three N minus 10. So the minimally three connected graphs are here. They live here. The rest of the graphs, you know, goes up to here, but the minimally three connected graphs live here. And the goal, our, our goal in this paper is to grow precisely the minimally three connected graphs, not to just generate a whole bunch of graphs and then check which ones are minimally three connected and throw out, which is also fine. That's what you want to do, but that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to generate precisely the minimally three connected graphs, if and only if condition. Okay. So let's begin with the preliminaries, all the results that we use. And, um, you know, depending on, um, you know, um, I, I have a number of stopping points if we don't get to the entire slides, through the entire slides. But I feel like if you uh, just sort of understand some of these preliminary results, they're really helpful and useful in a number of different areas of graph theory. So, you know, even if you don't get we don't get to the very end, there's something to be gained from just talking about Tut's results and Seymour's results um, and all these wonderful construction theorems. Okay, so Tut proved, and this is his famous wheels theorem, uh, if G is a simple three connected graph that's not a wheel, then there will always be an L edge that you can delete or contract and get something that is simple and three connected. So simple is key. And the wheels are the only exceptions because if you delete an edge, they, if you delete a rim edge, rim, um, you know, an edge around here would be a rim edge. So if you delete uh, this edge here, then you get this graph, which is obviously not three connected, right? And then if you delete this edge, you get this graph again, which is obviously not three connected. 
and likewise for the contractions you can delete uh, you can contract this edge and then you will get this graph which is not simple and same for the uh, spoke all right so uh, cut proof that the wheels are the only exceptions every other three connected graph you can delete an edge or contract an edge and get something that is simple and three connected um, and then in 1980 um, as uh, Paul Seymour proved that you can do that and maintain the H minor here. That's the key thing. It's like, you, you know, you, you don't always have to start with a wheel. You can start anywhere and maintain the H minor. And uh, a little bit on the hypothesis, this particular hypothesis here comes from uh, Cullard and Oxley, where um, the original hypothesis was a little bit longer and they simplified it to G is not a wheel and H is not W3. So if you have a graph G, three connected, and a minor H, three connected, then you can get the same result as Tutts wheels theorem with the addition of the H minor. And um, so, so this result is a Metroid result, and it's, it's in, in Metroid language. Um, but Nagami gave a completely graph theoretic proof of it. So now the operations opposite deletions and contractions are edge additions and vertex splits. And once again, edge addition is very simple to understand. Adding an edge, you know, you just add the edge. Just make sure you don't add something that is, uh, that, you know, would, would make the graph not simple. This is like a multi-edge. Just don't do this. But adding an edge between um, uh, two vertices is just that, throw in the edge. And we'll denote it by G plus E. And if you start with a three connected graph, then G plus E is also going to be three connected. Edge addition preserves three connected. So is it good so far? Okay, so my next slide is Vertex split, and the vertex split operation intuitively is actually quite easy to understand, but when you write it out, there are some details that have to be uh, made clear uh, to avoid confusion. So the operation opposite contraction is to, to split this vertex. So take this vertex here and split it. It's, a, it's actually a great name, sort of uh, blow it back up. Contraction was you contract and you blow it back up. But in order to make sure that the graph is reconnected, just make sure that every vertex is degree at least three. Now, you get a different vertex split for different choices of the neighbors that you choose. So, you could have V1 attached to this one, this one, and maybe that one. So there's a lot of choice here. Um, and if we were being very precise, we would uh, denote the vertex split as G dot ST, and this is the new edge at F that gets added, where S is the vertices that get attached to one, and T is the vertices that get attached to two. But by a slight abuse of notation, we'll just say G dot F, all right? So vertex split also preserves three connectivity. Again, the concept is quite simple and intuitive, but when you actually write it out, there's a little bit of details because it's not just one way that you can split it, there's multiple ways, okay. So these are the constructive versions of Beale's theorem and splitter theorem. So the, the version that I presented earlier was the top-down version, and this is the constructive version. So um, let um, uh, so you, let G be a simple three-connected graph that is not a wheel. Then G can be constructed from a wheel by a finite sequence of edge additions or vertex splits. So you sort of grow it. Um, and I have a little bit of a visual here. This is W4. So you can add an edge and you get K5 delete E. You add two edges, you get K5. Uh, you split the vertex, split the central vertex here. One way you get prism, another way you get K23 and so on. 
the splitter theorem again. And this says, well, you can do the same thing, except instead of starting with a wheel, right? Instead of starting with a wheel, you can start anywhere with any three connected minor. All right, so that's the, that's the difference between the wheels theorem and the splitter theorem. Okay. Now, I have to introduce some more operations. Um, so a pair of distinct edges A, B, and C, D is bridged if they are subdivided by vertices X and Y. So put a vertex there and then put a vertex there and join them. So that's X and Y. And there's a reason that I have it drawn like this instead of just putting the other vertex here and joining the edge. So I could have put a vertex here, here, and just joined the edge, but I want to show it like this for um, uh, later on. So bridging edges also preserves three connectivity. And Tut proved in 1967 that um, if G and H are three connected cubic graphs, um, one which is a minor of the other, then you can obtain G from H by repeatedly bridging edges and each graph obtained this way is three connected. So that's a great construction for obtaining three connected cubic graphs, okay? Um, so the cubic graphs live here along this line. So it's a great construction for this. And our goal again is to grow precisely the minimally three connected graphs. So I hope that with this introduction, I think that's the last slide of my introduction. Oh no, there's more stuff. <laughs> but, um, uh, but I hope that this slide tells you what we're doing. Just like there is, a Tut has given a um, way to grow precisely the minimally three, uh, the cubic graphs, we want to do the same for minimally three connected graphs. All right, so far, any questions? Okay. Okay, more operations. Um, so now this is where Barnett and Grunbaum come in. Um, they, they gave another operation, a vertex X and an edge AB is bridged if you just join this with an edge as shown over here, right? So bridging an, a vertex and an edge preserves three connectivity. And they gave a sort of like, a, a slightly different version of the wheels theorem, uh, but it's equivalent because you know you have G's three connected if and only if, and the wheels theorem is also the same. So you can start with W3 and add edges, bridge a vertex and an edge, or bridge two edges. So it's a slightly different uh, variant on the wheels theorem. Okay. So let's summarize what we have here. Bridging a vertex and an edge, bridging two edges. And then this is where DOS comes in. That's that was in the sum in the in the abstract. DOS came in with a third operation. Select three distinct vertices X, Y, Z, and link all three to another vertex W, like this. In other words, you know, add a degree three vertex to your graph, right? That's what you're doing. So if this is your graph down here, you know, you have a graph, you just add the degree three vertex to it. So again, this one preserves three connectivity, this operation. If you're starting with a three connected graph, you tack on a degree three vertex and you maintain three connectivity. So that's his paper. And he showed that if we begin with a minimally three connected graph and apply one of these uh, one uh, one of the three operations, and we're going to um, uh, start calling them d1, d2, d3 because we refer to them over and over again, the resulting graph will also be minimally three connected if and only if certain conditions are met. In the next three slides, that's the conditions. So takes a little while to go through those conditions, all right? So I need a couple of definitions here. A chord of C of a cycle is just an edge that links two vertices. And a chording path 
is this. So instead of the text, let's just look at the picture. So here's your cycle, right? And this would be a cording path. I just make sure that the edges of C are not in the cording path. So we don't want to, uh, you know, do something like this. We don't want to go through that and then come like this. So that wouldn't be a cording path. All right, so coding path is actually a central uh, um, component of this work. So this, so just let me pause over here and give you a chance to be clear about it. So you take a cycle and a path that cords it like this is a coding path. Okay. So here are the three operations, and this was bridging a vertex and an edge, and this is bridging two edges, and this is tacking on a degree three vertex, and I'm just gonna call them D1, D2, and D3 in honor of doors, I suppose. Um, so he defined this thing called three compatible set for each of them. So set S consisting of a vertex and an edge, right, is three compatible, if there is no XA or XB cording path in G without this edge. So this cannot happen. So in each case, uh, the thing has come up again, the downside of not having it full screen, uh, the, this thing cannot happen, all right? This cannot happen here. So that's, okay. So the three operations again, we're talking about the second one now. So let S be a set of two edges, A, B, and C, D. And it is a three compatible set if you don't have something like this. So there's no A, C. This would be an A, C coding part. And there's nothing like this. There's no A. There's no BC, there's no AD or BD coding paths, all right? And now by the third operation. So a set X, S equals XYZ of three vertices, uh, where XYZ are distinct, is a three compatible set if you don't have a coding path. Okay, I hope with the, with the endless repetition, what a coding path is, is roughly clear, okay? All right, any questions? Okay. So Dawes said, this is, he has two theorems, this is just beautiful results. So you start with a minimally three connected graph, right? H is minimally three connected. G can be constructed from H by applying D1, D2, or the D3, the three operations here, to a set S of edges or vertices of H, provided S is three compatible. So that's a beautiful if and only if condition. So if you, you can start, start with H and you can grow up to G if you make sure that you do these operations and you check that three compatible condition, okay? And then the second result is, this is how you can get all of them. G is minimally three connected, if and only if there exists a minimally three connected smaller graph, right? Smaller graph G, G prime, such that G can be constructed by applying D1, D2, or D3 to a T3 compatible set in G prime. Now, to check if a set is three compatible, we have to check coding paths. And to check for coding paths, we need to know the cycles of the graph, which is an NP-complete problem. So any, anything you can do to improve, to do things faster is, you know, something good. So our strategy for obtaining the cycles of G is to use the cycles of the parent graph, G prime. And we do this by breaking the operations D1, D2, and D3 into edge additions and vertex splits. So if you think of edge additions and vertex splits as touch operations, since he was the one who came up with, so we take um, the, the Barnett and Grunbaum and Dawes operations and turn it into edge additions and vertex splits, all right? So 
that's the end of the preliminaries. All right. Uh, so um, well, I guess we did. Um, uh, we finished the introduction and the preliminaries. So this is now um, a long section again. But not to worry, the last two sections are just a few slides. So the main, um, as I said in the abstract, I want to focus on the mathematics of the, the work. And uh, we have to prove the algorithm is correct and the algorithm is exhaustive. So uh, to begin with, let me show you how to translate these operations into edge additions and vertex splits. It's, um, you really have to look at it a certain way and then it's straightforward. So there's not a lot of, uh, you know, writing over here. If you just look at it a certain way, it becomes clear. So bridging a vertex and an edge means just doing this, right? You can do, you can add an edge, right? That's not adding an edge. You can only add an edge between two existing vertices, and then you can split it. So bridging a vertex and an edge, right? Operation D1 is equivalent to adding an edge and splitting a vertex, okay? Similarly, this is operation D2, bridging two edges, right? Which is essentially this is equivalent to adding an edge, splitting it, and then splitting the other side in the same way. So you're splitting it. So that's equivalent to G plus E, and you split one end and then you split another end. So I'll say that again. So you get that intuitive picture. So you've got this graph. Add an edge in the graph between two existing vertices. You split one end and you split the other end. And that's it. Okay. Um, and this one too is um, can be expressed in terms of edge additions and vertex splits, right? So you add an edge. You've got three vertices in the graph. Add an edge. Add, add another one so that uh, you know, you could add it here or here, right? And then split this vertex here, just this one here, right? And that's how you get this. So that's a degree three vertex. That's also a degree three vertex. It's just drawn differently. So a lot of this is just looking at it right. And our original intuition could can literally be encapsulated in uh, you, the thing that I said, you know, you split one end, you add an edge, you split one end and split the other end and that's it. <laughs> so uh, everything sort of came from, you know, that insight. Um, okay, so this is uh, one of our construction theorems where we uh, express operations D1, D2 and D3 in terms of edge additions and vertex splits. So you don't have to read the actual theorem. What I said is a lot easier to grasp. You take the D1, D2, D3 and turn it into edge additions and vertex splits. There you go. One of them, there's the other, and there's the third. So the process of getting this result is not as linear as I've presented it here. We actually proved this first before we knew of DAWs or anything else. So, um, and, um, you know, so, and then we sort of pieced it all together and then, you know, you present it backwards in this linear manner. So we proved this completely independent of the other stuff. Um, okay, so the next thing that we need to uh, get a decent algorithm is what we're calling a cycle coding lemma. And here I have a proof for you that I can actually write out the full proof because it's so straightforward. So if you are, um, so this works for any two connected graph also, but it doesn't work for a one connected graph. So let C be the number of cycles of G. So let G dash be obtained from G by adding this edge, okay, add that edge. 
how to get the cycles of g dash? Very simple. Well, the original cycles of g that don't have anything to do with this cycle where you added an edge, and the other, so you've broken a cycle into two cycles, and this, and this one. There you go. That's what this is saying. So the cycles of G, actually including this one, the big one, right? The cycles of G, and then this piece and this piece. So that, that is the full proof. So there you, we have a proof in my talk. I wanted to make sure I had a proof. Very simple. Now, as simple as this was, the next one it, well, it runs, it's a three-page argument in the paper. Uh, but, but you know, the idea, again, there's an intuition behind everything, and then the rest is just details. So here's the change in perspective on vertex split. So you think of a vertex split as two atomic operations. One is you subdivide the edge, right? So that's what we have here, and subdivision. And then this edge. So if you just look at the screen for a moment, see this edge. If you take it and you flip it here, so you go from here, you flip it here, all right? So subdividing an edge, again, you get the cycles very simply, very easily. If you take the cycle and then, you know, you add on the vertex V over there to the cycles that have that edge. But for the second one, we need, that's where the work is. So we think of two as flipping the edge AB to AC. And that's what's happening, right? As I showed earlier, you take this edge and you flip it. And I've got a little thing over here in three different letters. So you have ABC. So you take this edge and you flip it here. And that's what we're doing. So uh, three pages later, we get the complexity of um, of 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 the edge flip, and we're calling it the edge flip lemma, and you get the complexity of that, all right? So the proof is detailed, and the fact that it's C square N um, on the order of C square N, not just CN, is because in one case, we have to check where two cycles in G combine to form one cycle in G prime, so we have to check pairs of cycles, all right? And the, but there's a lot of cases that actually make this work, okay? So this puts it all together, uh, and the proof is just the two lemmas. Um, let G dash be a simple graph obtained from a smaller three-connected graph G by one of these operations. Let N be the number of vertices in G, and C be the number of cycles. Then you get all the cycles in, um, in uh, based on the cycles of G dash. So we're growing, almost like growing cycles too. So it's a a little bit easier than checking the cycles every time, right? So, okay. So now, uh, recall Dawes theorem two, and I just put it there in small, so it's up there. So you can grow minimally three connected graphs by applying operations B1, B2, or D3 to a three compatible set in G prime. There's a couple of cases that we have to a pull apart before we express it entirely in terms of deletions and contractions. And that is the wheels. So to get W4 from W3, you have to apply operation D1. And for us, that would mean adding a parallel edge. And you don't want to do that. We, we, our edges that we add are not uh, multiple edges, right? So we avoid this by using Dirac's theorem and starting with the prism, right? Dirac's excluded minor result says that the graphs without a prism minor are the wheels, K5, K5 delete an edge, and the ones that you get from K3 and minus three. So if you just start with the prism instead of as he does with the wheels, we don't have to worry about this particular problem. And one, um, and uh, yeah, so, um, Let's see. Um, yeah. So here we have, um, yeah, this also we have to check and make sure that the wheels grow from smaller wheels. So we're not, uh, so, so when you're growing the prism graph, 
the, the graphs that have prism minor, you don't accidentally have to deal with the wheel. So all the wheels are grown from smaller wheels with three compatible sets, okay? So, and likewise for K3, N minus three, they're grown from smaller K3, N minus three with three compatible sets. So we can take care of that with no problem. And then we get a uh, main theorem here. So uh, these are the two cases, um, uh, you know, a couple of paragraphs of proof writing out for each. And then this is the key result here. How are we doing on time? Okay, so we still have time. Okay, so uh, how many slides left? Um, Thirty-five. So I can maybe go a little bit slower and uh, say, ask if there are any questions so far, since um, I'm a little ahead of what I expected. Any questions? So far, so good. Okay. So now we come to the algorithm. I think this is the last slide before I start talking about the algorithm. So this is number three again. We took care of those two cases, made sure they wouldn't get in the way. And this is how we grow the graphs. You start with a graph, right? You add an edge and you add another edge. Right? You do a vertex split here and another vertex split. You do a vertex split in a very precise manner here where you have the uh, two edges, E1 and E2, are um, incident to the same vertex. And you don't have to worry about adding more edges and growing, uh, doing vertex splits here, because the theory says these, so suppose you do G plus E1, E2, E3, for example, and then you do a vertex split, the theory says that's going to have a deletable edge. It will not be minimally connected. So this is how we grow the grass. All right. A little bit about the uh, how the code is written and the implementation, but not much. Um, so we start with the prism. We add an edge to non-adjacent uh, to uh, to every non-adjacent pair to get a type three B graph. Uh, and then add an edge incident to the edge that we already did to get a type C graph. So you can think of these as containers, like little boxes. Um, these will have all, this This box will have all the, the three connected um, edge additions of the prism graph. And then this box will have all the non-isomorphic, I should start talking non-isomorphic here, non-isomorphic three connected extensions of B, but you're only adding edges that are incident to the edge that you added there. So these are boxes that contain non-isomorphic graphs. Then here, after you add an edge, you're splitting one vertex and then splitting the other. That, this was, this is my key insight. I, mean, I have two co-authors, and they had different key insights. I know that one of my co-authors, the key insight was the edge flip lemma. That's what gave us that nice complexity. Uh, but this was my key insight, that you add an edge and that you, you, uh, you um, split one end, and then you split the other, and then you don't have to split anything else. Just you get if you do split anything else, you get graphs that are not minimally three connected, and that's what the theory. That's all the theorem say. So here, when you um, when you add, uh, let's see, can't do too much with this. So this part here, when you add three, when you add a um, you know degree three vertex you split it in exactly one way. So this container here, A3, has one graph for everyone here. Like literally one graph. Not, I'm not saying one, 
non-isomorphic graph, I'm saying like one graph for everyone here. And at every stage, you're checking isomorphism and keeping only the non-isomorphic graphs. But the operation from C to this is just one. That's a big savings, even in you when we use this in theory uh, for proving excluded minor results. It's a big savings in computation. And so on and on we go. Um, And the reason we call this an infinite bookshelf is precisely because of this. It looks like a bookshelf. So, I mean, we wanted, it, it, we, start, we gave it a name. Um, so my, uh, my husband, Robert King, and I, when we were working on it, he said, you know, we were at first describing it in all sorts of ways. And then like one of us said, well, why, why don't we just call it a bookshelf? Like I have several bookshelves right here. And then that name just sort of stuck. It looks like a bookshelf. You're putting things in different um, uh, bookshelves. Um, and then another key insight from an implementation standpoint, in order to make isomorphism checking manageable so that it doesn't, you know, combinatorial explosion blows things up, is that at any point, we're always working in one shelf of the bookshelf. So everything when you're here, you check these. You're, you're checking to see from all of these places. So you're always in one place, um, one shelf, and it makes isomorphism checking easier. So those three operations, d1, d2, and d3, they were at, in one place. You were adding one edge, and another place you were adding two edges. Um, another place three edges. So that that was that would be hard to keep track of. So this. A scheme makes it easy to keep track of everything. So it's it's, it's really you know um, an algorithm. You know, just um, I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm saying stating the obvious here. Um, and I, finally, this is my last slide for next steps. All right. So we've been uh, since the paper was accepted, we've been looking at cyclically four connected cubic graphs. So because you can't raise the connectivity of a cubic graph, right, and go to four connected, they only have three uh, edges per vertex, um, because you can't raise the con uh, connectivity. So we look at cyclically k-connected cubic graphs, and in particular, cyclically four connected cubic graphs is if you have, um, and it's edge connectivity, so you have to make sure that you don't have three edges that you remove and keep a cycle in both sides, right? So uh, you can remove three edges, but uh, you cannot have a cycle in two sides. Um, so that's sort of a smaller, more important class of cubic graphs than just three connected graphs. And there is actually a result by Vermal and a few other people that give a construction result for cyclically four connected cubic graphs. Uh, now, I haven't mentioned any applications at all, but um, cubic graphs are one of the most applied things for physicists and chemists and uh, just like, you know, like maybe, you know, 50 papers on its applications and importance. Um, and I have been bitten by the snark bug. Uh, a snark is a cyclically co-connected um, uh, GERC5 cubic graph that is uh, that is um, uh, that has uh, its edge colorable is four instead of three. Uh, four edge colorable, and these are. Um, uh, Martin Gardner, I think, suggested the name SNARK for them because they are rare and they are important in, uh, in graph theory. They serve as counterexamples to things. In fact, a lot of big conjectures are proven with the exception of the cubic graph. So that's why cubic graphs is a very important thing in uh, graph theory. And I'm just, you know, I keep chasing SNARKs. I mean, uh, I read about it as in like you get you get so excited about it and I'm so close to it. I feel like I'm close to it, but then I find an example 
that uh, you know disproves the conjecture that I have. So I think we can generate cyclically four connected GERC5 graphs, starting with the Peterson, and there's a big result that um, the paper just came out by Robertson, Seymour, and Thomas says it all starts at Peterson minor, right? So you can start with the Peterson and using all the stuff I can generate, um, but, but the edge colorable piece is still uh, unknown. And I'd like to end by saying that my book, Graphs and Networks, which meant classical graph theory and modern network science is available for free print, uh, for uh, free purchase on Amazon, in case anybody is interested. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let us thank the speaker. Are there any questions? Uh, Sanjara, can you say something about uh, are there any similar results for four connected graphs? So, um, so four, yes, there is a four connected graphs is a wonderful result by Slater where uh, you can generate four connected graphs, uh, but there's no Slater theorem for it, but uh, and that's what we're trying to do. But the operations are more. So it's, uh, it's, um, it's a result by Slater, um, and I can't uh, think of exactly what the result is. You can generate four connected graph from a smaller four connected graph, but there's more operations. So there's like three more operations, and it's slightly complicated operations. So I haven't figured out how to, um, you know, encode it in in a way that's manageable. But that's my next thing. Yeah, I should have put that here for connected graphs and uh, building on Slater, Peter Slater's work. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Well, thank you for listening. And, uh, yeah, thank you. thank you. Thank you. And we'll let us all thank the speaker again. And uh, our speaker next week will be Maria Aksenovich.